If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Michael Bassett and I had a wonderful look at history of our parliament before the election. And in that discussion, he declared that the Ardern Hipkins regime were the worst government in living history. I'll check in with him to see if he still thinks that, and then I'll ask him about the challenges that Christopher Luxon's government faces. He joins me on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Michael Bassett. It's good to have you. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, before the election, uh, we had a discussion and you decided or, or told me that you thought that the previous government was the worst government in modern history. And I pushed you a little bit further and then and you had to think about it, but then you agreed that perhaps was the worst government we've ever had. Do you still agree with that? Yes, I do. I mean, it was just a terrible government. Uh, they'd done no work prior to coming to office. They had more than 200 committees trying to devise things for them to do after they got to office. Uh, they had some baggage, um, nonsensical uh, ideas about the treaty and um, a bit of an approach to welfare, which if they'd known anything about Labour's tradition, uh, they'd have known it was wrong, namely that the best way to fix welfare problems is to shower them with money. And, uh, I mean, the evidence has been there for donkey's years that the more money you shower out, the more people become dependent upon it and uh, decide that free money is easier than having to work for it. And, uh, I mean, that government was so badly prepared intellectually bereft and uh, had read almost nothing about their Labour Party antecedents. And uh, therefore, I think they deserve that uh, appellation, the worst government in modern history. If you look at Grant Robertson, he took New Zealand's uh, debt from $5 billion to something like $95 billion. Mm. With the media cheering him on, you know, uh, like he was God's gift to accounting, and and then we see in recent weeks this huge uproar over, uh, you know, thirteen thousand dollars worth of uh, entitlements for the prime minister's accommodation, and they've written more words about Christopher Luxon's accommodation than they have ever written about Grant Robertson's financial prowess. Well, that's absolutely right. But then what else do you expect from the modern media? Mm. Most of them have so little academic training. They don't read much. Uh, they are sort of born lefties. They think that uh, the world owes everybody a living. And therefore, they're not inclined to uh, believe anything that comes out of uh, Luxon. I think, uh, to be fair to everybody, that Chris Luxon handled that business uh, of his entitlement for his apartment very stupidly. Uh, I mean, the obvious thing was that he should have just taken the same entitlement that all the other ministers and uh, MPs took. Namely, um, I forget what the actual sum is, but it's specified. There was a little top up if you were prime minister. And I mean, he was entitled to the same um, sum as anybody else. We see this pervasive attitude within the media. I mean, Duncan Garner wrote last week about the Warner Brothers Discovery decision to let News Hub die. And he said, did Warner Brothers Discovery HQ make every effort to save News Hub? Letting it die is not the Kiwi way. And it seems that he thinks that the Kiwi way is the state paying the huge salaries he's earned uh, when working for those organisations. And if you watch the media all the time, and uh, I think you're as good a watcher of it as I am, yep. um, uh, that's the prevailing thinking. Any problem that anybody has, the government should fix. I mean, get real. Uh, don't people have a responsibility for their own lives? And um, the same goes for business. Uh, that's a private 
outfit, TV3, News Hub, why on earth should the government come rushing in to uh, prop them up when they foul their nest? Well, and, and I don't think TV3 has ever made a profit in its entire existence. Probably. So, you know, it's it's sho- shoveling good money after bad. Um, yeah, TV1's not doing much better either by the look of it. Well, that's probably why Simon Power re- um, quit as the chief executive. He knew what was coming. <laughs> Might well be. But... The media, I guess, are a bellwether for the challenges that Christopher Luxon's government faces. Now, you've written an article on your website, Bassett, Brash and Hyde, about the challenges of Christopher Luxon's government, apart from doing stupid things, like you mentioned about the accommodation. I mean, he should have just held his ground and it would have died. But once he vacillated, once he turned around his position, then the media then knew well, we just have to put some pressure on Christopher Luxon and he'll do a runner. Yes, that is always the danger with that. But, uh, in st- I mean, the real thing is that he hadn't thought it through before it came up and became public. Of course he was entitled to the same amount that all other ministers and um, MPs are entitled to when he has to live in his own accommodation in Wellington and pay the outgoings on that. But he didn't think that through. He he decided that the amount of money that was paid to the prime minister, which was substantially higher than the others got, was all okay and above board. And, I mean, if he'd gone for just the same entitlement everybody else had, who could second guess it? But instead he backtracked on the whole thing. Mm. And now he is the only minister living in his own uh, uh, property, uh, uh, who um, isn't getting any. It was was bad politics all around, from from Luxon to the media to the opposition crowing about it as well. And now we've got the ridiculous situation where this Ardern-created board that's supposed to look after this property is telling us all as taxpayers there's $30 million, which we know will be $50 million. Um, oh, I don't it, agree. it needs to, you know, in repairs. Well, if it was a business looking at that proposition, we've got a house, it's dilapidated, it needs uh, significant repairs to be brought up to stand. We just make the decision to bowl the stupid thing and build something else for much less than $30 million. Well, the trouble is that you're talking to somebody who actually is responsible for Premier House in the first instance, and mm. that's me. Uh, <laughs> my ministerial house was actually in the grounds of Premier House, mm. and I used to have to drive past this thing every day, and slowly it was sort of crumbling. And it was the first prime ministerial house in New Zealand. Uh, Julius Vogel had it uh, in the 1870s. And, in fact, it was inhabited by all the prime ministers through until uh, Mickey Savage, who had no family and decided he didn't want to live in it in 1935, whereupon they let it be used as uh, the dental clinic Mm. and became the sort of murder house was what it used to be called until um, uh, the need for dental nurses got so low that uh, they no longer needed the training facility and pulled out, whereupon the house started to crumble. And here am I going backwards and forwards every day looking at this thing and discovering that Fran Wilde, when she became an uh, Associate Minister of Conservation in 1987, had banged a preservation order on it as an historic house. So clearly pulling it down wasn't an option. And I thought, right, I'm chairman of the 1990 commission. We're uh, going to be making grants to for various purposes around the country, Auckland, Wellington, Whanganui in particular, and Auckland. And so I put up a million dollars from the Lottery Grants Board and said this will be a present to Wellington to have this house restored. And uh, we did, and it cost a little bit more than a million, but... The thing was functional, and Geoffrey Palmer moved in as Prime Minister early in 1990. Mm. Well, the notion that it's $30 million 
is frankly just ridiculous to fix it. I'll bet my boots that for two or three million dollars, you could get that place completely functional again. It is an historic house. It's probably, uh, I mean, you've no idea what we discovered in it. Mm. Uh, I mean, there'd been a fire in the place that had all been boarded up. I remember going and having a look at all these uh, burnt things dating back to Vogel's time that were being pulled out of mm. the place. So anyway, don't let's spend too much time on Premier House. Maybe, but, maybe it needs another fire, a good long one. No, well, it's it's an historic house. I mean, I... Well, they burn down. Probably. Yes, they do. But uh, if they can be preserved, I don't think they should be. Uh, they should be allowed to burn down, no. And um, if for a relatively small sum of money, that fairly significant place, and it's it's a, got very good entertainment facilities mm. in it. I mean, I launched a couple of books at Premier House, uh, a couple of my political biographies, and uh, I've been to lots of functions there, and it, it's worthy of preservation. So long as it doesn't cost thirty million. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a little known fact that in 1992 I lived for about eight or nine months at Vogel House in uh, in Lower Hutt. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Well, Doug Graham lived there at the time, and oh, yes. um, uh, I was moving to Wellington, and so I needed some accommodation, and I stayed there. Um, yeah, you know, it was an interesting insight into how ministers live. Um, the the you know, the time of day that they get up and go to work and you know like I, I can remember Doug having his bowl of cereal and a cigar at something like five in the morning. Five <laughs> in the morning? That sounds awfully early for Doug. He didn't. Nothing moved him very rapidly. Oh well, no, he was always up around five a.m. having breakfast and that. He was gone by six. Um, yeah, so you know you don't get to know these things unless you're actually in the household. So, um, but that was an interesting um, experience living there with the ghost, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went there on a number of occasions when Longy was first, and, mm. and uh, but Longy wanted to come back to uh, town to uh, be closer to his lover, and uh, well, he had, he had crown limousines to carter around. I don't know why that was a problem. Oh, and drive your own car was better. Well, it's a famously apparently. Uh, Robert Muldoon used to drive his Triumph 2000 down the hut motorway, inebriated, um, you know, basically surrounded by police making sure he didn't crash. Well, on the night when he called the snap election in 1984, uh, the chief whip uh, ran down into the basement and let the tyres down on his car yeah. to stop him from going home. They thought, hell, with an election coming up, it'd be just our luck for him to be caught speeding or doing something crazy. Yeah, and they're totally. So anyway, let's get on to these challenges that you think that the Luxon government faces. Well, they're manifold in my view. Uh, probably the biggest single one is the bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, we've noticed that there are leaks taking place all the time. I mean, that's a terrible thing to do, to leak a cabinet paper before it's even been seen by the minister, let alone seen by the cabinet. Mm. Uh, uh, is a high crime and misdemeanor in uh, terms of how civil servants should operate. And um, they have clearly gotten a head of steam on, and I think it's because they had so much to do with the policy of the Labour Party when they were in office, that six years they were there, that they've come to treat the Labour policies as though they were their own. And uh, they don't like the thought that uh, they're going to be unravelled. Many of them have been unravelled now. More will be, and there's a substantial change of direction. But worse than that, there's nearly 16,000 more of them on the payroll all enjoying uh, quite uh, luxurious uh, by comparable standards uh, in the private sector incomes. Mm. And uh, they don't want to lose their jobs. And so consequently, they're determined to make life as difficult for this government as possible. 
And there seems to be, as yet, I, I don't think there's a new head of the civil service. I think the public service commissioner was was going to retire. Whether he has, I don't know. Yeah, he's announced his retirement, but he's he's still there. Yeah, and and they haven't got a, a successor, as far as I know. And, um, I mean, that successor has one tough job. He's going to have to convince a very unprepossessing collection of heads of departments, several of whom should have offered their resignations when the government changed, to actually behave and uh, make sure that their um, employees follow the rules, like supporting the actions not out campaigning for them, but doing what the uh, new ministers want. Yeah, I mean, a classic case of that is this repeal of the rather stupid smoking legislation that Labor brought in. And we culminated in Hipkins screeching across the House, this policy will kill people. You know, there was never any screeching when other policies that he did that would demonstrably kill people. But it was just ludicrous because... The smoking rates were dropping anyway. They were below the targets that were set uh, many years ago for smoking rates. And it was an ideological um, burp, uh, to paraphrase, um, I think it was Michael Cullen. David David Longy. Or David Longy, yeah. (laughs) Uh, It was either one one or other of them, the only two brains that they had between them, you know. So it was a ridiculous policy that there was no need for it at all. And now we've got this claim that, oh, Maori are going to be disadvantaged because they smoke more than others. And they ignore the logical conclusion that you come to, which is, well, if Maori are going to be so terribly affected by this, well, why don't we just legislate to say no Maori can buy cigarettes? (laughs) Can you imagine the outcry if that happened? I can imagine the outcry uh, uh, quite easily. Oh, I was the first Minister of Health to introduce the tobacco tax to Mm. lift it in the budget of 1984. At that time, about 28% of the population smoked. Mm. And as the rate of tax has gone up, the number of smokers has fallen substantially and it's down to 6% now. We have to say that that policy is working um, I mean, you don't see many people smoking these days. Uh, it's rather rare. And uh, if they are smoking, then they've had to pay a fortune for it. So the policy that the Labour Party had introduced a huge uh, sort of a sledgehammer to uh, uh, crack a nut. Mm. Uh, and um, besides, it hadn't come into force yet anyway. Exactly. And it was ridiculous. Uh, and so the uh, the new government kicked it. And the problems, I mean, there's even a fool of a, of a cartoon in the Herald this morning that uh, has somebody holding a fag. Very sad and unnecessary nonsense. But that's the media, you see. They're, they're as much agitators as these embedded uh, civil servants who think that the policy ideas are theirs and they're sacrosanct. But what we saw with the Labour government uh, in, over the last six years or the preceding six years was this locking in of spending with no accountability for, A, where the money's going to come from in the future, and B, uh, no accountability for, is this, um, you know, effective ways to spend taxpayers' dollars? And then the moment the new government comes in and says, right, we're going to remove that spending or we're going to remove that, it's calamitous. The world's ending. Um, You know, this spending means that kids are going to starve You know, before we had free lunches at schools, how did the kids get to school and what did they eat then? I mean, you know. Strangely enough, their parents actually accepted some responsibility for them. Mm. Parents, Parents, I mean, and even if you're a beneficiary, the benefit is actually paid for the kid. And for looking after the child, not for lying in bed and um, uh, bonking or whatever it is uh, you're choosing to do when mm. you be up um, making your kid's lunch and sending it to school, making sure it goes to school, uh, I should say. Uh, but, I mean, the, the money that is paid on behalf of the child is treated as though it is a parental entitlement mm. by far too many people. 
And uh, I am of the opinion that until such time as you follow the money, you're not going to get parents doing their job properly. It is possible to marry up attendance rates at school with benefit payments. And uh, as soon as you started to deduct money from uh, benefits because the kids weren't sent to school. They all of a sudden turn up at school, don't they? I think you, they certainly will. And I think the parents will have a, will ha- suddenly realise that they have a vested interest in getting the kid to school. But uh, life has just been made too easy. And I blame Carmel Cipollone. We were talking earlier about the worst government. She is unbelievably the worst minister of social welfare this country has ever had. She doesn't even begin to understand what the welfare state was about. Well, I mean, the welfare state was always designed as a safety net. Yes. And this last government turned it into a trampoline. That's right. I mean, it was, a, it was a, um, what do they say, a, a hand up rather than a hand out. Mm. And- I mean, you made the comment earlier that we're creating a society where people expect the government to solve all of their problems. And that comes back to welfareism in a large, mm. in the way that it's been extended and extended and extended. I mean, working for families is a classic example. And John Key railed against it, said it was communism by stealth. And then when he was elected, not only did he keep it, he expanded it, yeah. you know, and, and that's the thing is that people then, once they're getting something from the state, they expect that to come every week and it becomes a, a death cycle for the taxpayer because yeah. there's less and less people inclined to become taxpayers and more and more people who become tax takers. Yep, Absolutely. I mean, that was some of the reforms that you and Roger Douglas oversaw, was to recalibrate this so that working people uh, were rewarded for their hard work and effort, their now, their intellect and all of those sorts of things, rather than continuing you know, under the Muldoon regime where you had some people get, you know, paying 66 cents in the dollar yep. in taxation. Absolutely. Well, the trouble was it didn't last long. Moreover, we need to acknowledge that uh, it wasn't just ordinary folk who had their fists into the uh, till and were taking taxpayers' money. Farmers especially. Farmers and business people. I mean, remember all the the, um, import protections and uh, things that existed? And uh, it was a license to print money, especially in motor vehicles. If you could get the import license for something, um, yeah. you know, that was you know, waved across the desk of Robert Muldoon, you ended up um, having a license to print vast sums of money. Well, that, that was true right from the word go. And uh, the awarding of import licenses was something of a scandal. I was told once by somebody who was present. When Walter Nash was Prime Minister, Prime Minister, for God's sake, was still deciding on import licences. And uh, there was a, a, a meeting and the, all these things that had put in applications for licences. And uh, Walter would say, no, no, no. And then there came um, tinned Canadian salmon. And Walter said, no, hang on a minute, minister, says one of the officials. Lots of working folk rather treat tinned Canadian salmon as a special treat at the weekend. Oh, said Walter. Oh, oh, well, OK, we'll allow a certain amount to come in. So indeed they did. Uh, and I mean, that was the scientific uh, nature of import controls. They were chaotic. Moreover, uh, some of it was um, it was one of the few examples of uh, corruption. I had a relative who made elements uh, for mm. uh, water heaters and so on. Oh yeah, and he used to have to get import licenses, and they all tracked down to Wellington regularly to see the Industries and Commerce Department to make applications. 
And my uncle made inquiries of a friend. How did you go about things? Oh, well, if you see Bert, somebody or other, if Bert's the official you see, this is the technique. You'll make your case to him. He'll then say, excuse me, I've got to nip out the back to the toilet. You'll discover that his top drawer of his desk is slightly open. If you drop a 10-pound note in there, you'll get your license. And my uncle said, indeed. He discovered uh, that Bert had his drawer open a little bit. And he thought, well, why is everybody else getting licenses and I'm not? So he dropped his 10-pound note in. And, I mean, scarcely a prince's ransom. You wouldn't call it corruption on a grand scale, except that that official clearly was doing quite well out of uh, mm. a government regulation. Yeah, I mean, the people have you know, long said that there's no corruption in New Zealand, and, and I've always said every time the Transparency International report comes out, well, these guys running around with blindfolds on. <laughs> well, like, think- there's so much corruption, it, it, particularly at local government level. I mean, there was a famous case where a lot of the footpath contracts and things like that were going to this little flea outfit um, that suddenly became a multi-million dollar turnover company, all off the basis of fixing footpaths in Auckland. Well, the only case I ever saw when I was actually a, a city councillor which I was in the early 70s, involved, uh, the only corruption involved contracts. And we formed the impression, the Works Committee, that uh, the particular engineer that had signed off the awards of contracts was a bit corrupt and he didn't stick around much longer. His position was made too hot to handle and uh, he cleared off. But I wondered sometimes as to whether uh, the works area is an area where corruption still exists. Oh, look, I, I know some good examples. Personally, having been involved in tendering for some contracts, particularly in defence, and that is absolutely rife with, you know, you, the only word you can use is to call it corruption, but nobody ever seems to do anything about it. But there's these cosy contracts that keep getting let to, you know, guys who, you know, were never any great shake as an officer in the in the military and now have, have resigned uh, their commissions, gone out on their own, have obtained, you know, their exclusive rights to a particular product or something like that, and all of a sudden that's what gets selected um, all the time. It's like this cosy little arrangement. It's all right, you can go out into the private sector, but we'll look after you by ordering all of your products. Well, maybe, uh, but remember, New Zealand is a tiny society. Mm. When it comes to finding people who will contract to do things, it's quite difficult sometimes. I mean, uh, councillors, I remember the uh, uh, councillors when I was on the works committee saying, well, who are you going to get to do this job that we had that we wanted done? And the truth was that contractors went running around barefoot and uh, sometimes a little bit of corruption uh, crept in in order to get a job done. But when I say New Zealand is a little society, I think everything is little. You've cited some examples. I've cited some examples. But it's small ca- scale stuff compared with overseas corruption. Oh yeah, it's it's not Very it's not in, it's not endemic and it's isolated, but it it's particularly lucrative for those involved. But you're right about New Zealand being a small society, and New Zealanders, even though they travel overseas, it's like they travel overseas with blinkers on, and they don't see that New Zealand is a total of a population of around 5 million people. Even if you add the, the the those who are New Zealanders but live overseas, which is thought to be another 1.5 million people, even at 6.5 million people, that's the size of an Australian city, you know, yeah. Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah. Um, and, and Brisbane's approaching, I think Brisbane's approaching 5 million as well. Mm. So we are tiny but we like to think we're bigger than we are. And we're like trying to live a first world lifestyle with really a second world income and in some respects, a third world income. 
Um, and, and a fourth world income uh, approach to uh, working. Uh, I mean, if uh, if ever there's an opportunity not to work, uh, you can count on Kiwis putting their hands forward. Yeah, I mean, we look at some of these roading projects, so they're a glaring example because, and also the rail projects, they're eye-watering sums of money that cannot be sustained by the population of New Zealand in total, and much less just Auckland City. But they they seem to be these gilt-edged projects that are mega billions of dollars and uh, no prospect of ever to returning anything to the ratepayers or the taxpayers who have to fund these massive boondoggles. Just on that count, the number of jobs that have been finished within the contracted amount could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Take Auckland, the city rail link, which is now almost ruined a sizable chunk of uh, the city just slightly west of Queen Street. And uh, when it was first mooted as a Len Brown project, it was $2.8 billion. By the time they got round to signing the contract, it was $4.4 billion. And uh, last sign of accounts, it was $5.6 billion. And it'll be well over $6 billion by the time it's finished. Now, what on earth has gone wrong? I mean, how, how can a country like New Zealand operate successfully if it can't calculate its infrastructure costings properly? There's any number of, of projects that you can look at that. Uh, you know, again, a Len Brown one, the Whitewater Rafting and Canoe Centre at Manukau. Build it and they'll come. You know, they didn't. <laughs> Nobody's come. It's it, you can drive past there on any day of the week and you won't see anybody there. You could fire a shotgun across the water and not hit a single thing. It's insane. We had Michael Wood, you know, the Labour uh, oh. Transport Minister, proposing oh. a cycle bridge that was going to cost as much as a replacement for, for the harbour bridge. They were going to build it beside. Oh. It was insane. They spent something like $25 million scoping it. Like, how on earth do you get to those sorts of money? Uh, you, you take the Northern Busway extension from Constellation to Otiha Valley. It's a distance of three and a half kilometres. It took seven years to build it. It's five lanes on either side. But what's ridiculous, at either end of that five lanes on either side, it's two lanes on either side. So you, all they succeeded in doing is moving the traffic jam from Otiha to Constellation, 3.5 yeah. kilometres closer to the city. You're quite right. I drove it just the other day, and uh, it, it's bizarre. You come sweeping down the new piece, and then you get near to Constellation Drive, and it all fouls up because cars are f fluffing in from the left uh, off Constellation Drive, and um, uh, everything is blocked then until Milford. Yeah, it, it, it is totally an appalling design. They go from five lanes to two lanes, and it's the same the other way around. For the, all those heading home to Whangapraa um, each night, they, they get to Constellation, they spread out across five lanes, and then they're back into two at Otiha and crawling all the way to Silverdale. Just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it cost moonbeams to do it. It's a good idea. I mean, the, the busway is a brilliant idea. I, I'll support busways all day long over and above trains because as soon as you get something happen with a train line, that's it. The, the whole system's closed down because nothing can move. The bus, At least with buses, they can drive on a side road. It's much more manoeuvrable, yes. I mean, yeah. that's the problem with trains. And yet Michael Wood, that same uh, uh, sainted Michael Wood, was going to give us a $30 billion um, centre of the city to the airport light rail. No, but it wasn't going to go to the – this is the big lie that he told, right? It was never going to go to the airport. It was only going to go to Mangere Town Centre, and then you caught a bus from there to the airport. Well, I That's how insane it was. I hadn't picked up on that. But, of course, its, it's origin was so suspicious. 
I mean, by the time Len Brown had done the CRL and Phil Goff had narrowed Queen Street to nothing so that there's a whole lot of uh, shops on either side of Queen Street with four lease signs in them and there was nothing really substantial left in the centre of the city, Michael Wood was going to funnel this uh, rail link in. I mean, just bizarre. No thinking, no sort of lateral thinking. The best idea for uh, rail to the airport, I mean, it's a silly idea at the best of times, mm. but the best idea was, you know, ironically, from, from a left-leaning councillor who said that they should put a spur off Puanui and head to the airport. That way it's very short. It was rural land all the way through, apart from a little bit at Manukau, and that would solve the problem for a fraction of the cost. And, of course, he was howled down and told he was stupid and didn't know what he was talking about. But, you know, Mike Lee actually had a very good idea, and it's a shame it's never been picked up. You know, it, it, would, be, it would have been more... He's had a lot of good ideas in the course of his life. Uh, yes, some I don't agree with, but... Uh... Sure, but, you know, that's the thing about Mike Lee is that it doesn't... This is the problem with the polarisation in politics. Just because somebody from another team has a good idea doesn't mean you should howl it down. It Sometimes they should be investigated, and Mike Lee's one of those people who yeah. actually thinks logically in, about these things and says, well, this is ridiculous spending this, much, this amount of billions of dollars wrecking the communities between the city and only hunger, and then from then on. He's saying, no, let's go out. We've already got a rail line that get, goes through Puanui. Put a spur off that. There's only about 200 houses that we need to bowl to, to make that happen. And then the rest of it's all rural land in a straight line directly to the airport. You know, well, I always, I've always thought that a couple of hundred more of those little vans with a trailer hooked on behind that goes to your house and picks you up and uh, trundles you off to the airport for a fee would have solved the problem anyway. And it sure as hell wouldn't have cost $29 billion. Even if, and if you wanted to have a dedicated method of transport, to those areas than allow those vans to go on a busway that you've built yeah. to go to the airport, yes. you know? Uh, yes, certainly. Well, so they should go on a busway, mm. just, to, just as I think Ubers ought to be allowed to go on um, busways if taxis can. Let's just get back to Luxon. You've said that it appears that he's short of solutions as well. I've picked that up as well. And it seems that National's been caught flat-footed on some policy areas, particularly in transport with the announcements on uh, Monday of this week, where they're going to hike particular rates and you know road user charges and things, but they're going to wait till the second term to do that. Oh, that's it's, because of uh, because of the promise that was yes. made, uh, that in effect, that we won't do this in the first term. And uh, they didn't qualify it that way. But, of course, when it comes to the second term, uh, you deal with that when that election uh, time comes around. Mm. Um, that's why they've done that, I'm sure. But um, the essential point, though, which, again, they can't explain properly, but which is understandable, the user should pay. Mm. Uh, there's no reason why my aged aunt, who um, uh, doesn't go anywhere much except in her little flivver, should have to pay huge sums for uh, bus transport if she never uses a bus, mm. or um, vice versa, the bus user should pay the petrol tax when they never uh, drive a car. Uh, I mean, a user pays is how it should be. And I think that's what the government is reaching towards. I don't think they're going far enough, though. We've got all these Probably cycleways not. and the user doesn't pay for the well, cycleways. Oh, I agree. I mean, I'm stunned that they've only cut that in half. Uh, why? Um, I mean, the cycleway stuff. I mean, for a kickoff, most cyclists don't adhere to uh, the cycleway policy. They'll drive on the road. Go along Ponsonby Road, and how many times do you have to uh, um, uh, just about bounce a bicycle uh, because they're not on the uh, 
Well, interestingly, I was driving down Ponsonby Road yesterday. I didn't see a cyclist at all. And that's the thing with these cycleways. You never see any cyclists on them. No, no. Uh, I go every, every, yeah, every Monday, I go out to Manukau for lunch with my mates. I drive down Cavendish Drive, which has got a cycleway built into the side of it. Never seen a cyclist on it. Not once. Well, take the waterfront drive where they've uh, done an elaborate cycle lane thing. And I've several times uh, recently encountered a cyclist on the main drag, on the main tarmac. Yeah, and the, the, the thing is with cyclists, um, they've got their little helpers in the media, people like Russell Brown and Simon uh, Wilson, oh, okay. and they scream blue murder if a single millimetre of cycleway is removed. They're almost more entitled than MPs are for entitlements. Yes, yes, and yet they don't pay a bean. No. Except through their rates, in as much as they pay rates, yeah. And of course, everybody pays rates because they pay them even through their uh, rents if they're renting. So, what do you think Luxon needs to do? I mean, my, I've often said when taking office in the first hundred days, literally, like perhaps in the first week, they need to line up all the heads of departments on the front steps of Parliament and metaphorically shoot one of them in the back of the head and then say to the others, now let, let, that, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> well, uh, they certainly need to be told. Uh, Kirk did that in 1972 when I was first elected. Uh, Kirk was sworn into office as Prime Minister and uh, he summoned all the um, heads of the departments around and uh, showed them the Labour Party's manifesto, this red glossy thing, and patted mm. it and said, this is what we're going to do and uh, this is what you're going to be asked to do and um, uh, follow the um, bureaucratic rules and do it. So that was as good as a what you've just suggested. It didn't involve shooting anybody, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting we shoot anybody, but you, you know what I mean is pick, I it, pick a senior civil servant, someone yeah. who's who's a bit mouthy and has had commented on things, and get rid of them. And then say to the rest, if you don't follow our instructions, that's going to happen to you. Well, several should have been uh, pushed out. I mean, the head of social welfare, the head of education. Police. Police. Health, of course, has been subjected to so much chaotic stuff, rather hard to find out who it would be that you'd be getting rid of. But uh, there should have been substantial offers of resignations. But uh, ministers, they're not a particularly strong set, I have to say. I don't think the Minister of Education is great. I think the Minister of Health is good, uh, showing some real class because he knows. Well, he knows a few, few, a few things knows. about it. <laughs> he does. But coming back to the Prime Minister, the first thing is you need excellent people in your office. And judging by the quality of the press statements and the speeches that have been given so far, they haven't yet found the best person. If a Prime Minister, even a new chum, has a good speechwriter, he or she can uh, be a hell of a lot better than otherwise they might seem. I don't know if you've ever watched the original Office um, TV program with Ricky Gervais in it, and he has a, he portrays a character called David Brent who who um, sits there and intones his knowledge of management and you know human resources and all that, and he's singularly hopeless at everything. I get the distinct impression that Christopher Luxon has studied at the right hand of David Brent and is exhibiting a lot of Brent-like characteristics, and it doesn't fill me with any confidence. Well, I, I haven't seen that program, and uh, I don't uh, know it. But uh, he certainly needs a better office staff than he's got. And... I think it's very important that he has some people around who are old hands and who can point to the dangers of things. I mean, a prime minister gets caught on the hop. It's in the nature of the job. Something suddenly blows out in left field. Mm. You haven't been schooled up on it. And you need somebody who's an old hand and who can say, oh, well, 
I wouldn't say too much about that just yet. Uh, there are two sides to that story. And so you, instead of wading in and making a statement that you'll do this or do that, or um, you, you, uh, you hold off until you've gotten yourself properly briefed. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, there's been a huge hiring frenzy and swapping out staff, uh, you know, since the change of government. But I've noticed a, a lot of familiar names turning up and, you know, they're less than average journalists who are now uh, sitting there in ministers' offices churning out press releases. And I'm thinking, what were you thinking hiring that person? Did, did you not read all of the things that they wrote about you when you were in opposition? Almost certainly not. Yeah, it's nuts. And there's no sort of like, there's no Heather Simpson type person no. uh, in the government that all of the staff and the ministers quiver in fear at seeing that number pop up on their phone, you know, and you're getting a summons to that office. You, no, no good is ever going to come of that summons. And so you, you quiver in fear. There doesn't seem to be anybody like that in the, in the Luxon led government. Well, too many of the ministers are quite new to Parliament. I mean, the Minister of Māori Affairs has only been there for five seconds uh, in Parliament, won a by-election in 2022, I think, didn't he? And yeah. um, uh, the uh, Minister of Education's not been there very long. Paul Goldsmith's one of the longest-serving uh, um, ministers. He'd done a little bit between 2014 and 2017, enough to uh, sort of have a bit of a handle on uh, some of the people, but too many of the other ministers just are quite new chums. Yeah, and Mark Mitchell's had a bit of experience, and I, I understand, not from Mark Mitchell himself, but from people that are close to what's going on there, that there's been a bit of a Donnybrook between him and the police commissioner over uh, all of these sort of ESG-type woke jobs that the police have created and the minister has said, we'll get rid of them. We don't need that. We need people on the street. And there's been quite a Donnybrook around that. But I'm not sure how Costa thinks he's going to win against the minister. Well, his Costa's uh, term, his five-year term comes up next year, I think, doesn't it? And I'd be very surprised if he's um, uh, reappointed. Yeah, I think the government is missing you know, a Heather Simpson type person or, or from the TV yeah. show, the thick of it, a, a, a Malcolm Tucker type um, character. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a, a Brit yeah. British comedy show and Peter Capaldi with his broad Scottish accent plays Malcolm Tucker, who's the enforcer of the government. Um, there's some just brilliant lines from there, but there doesn't seem to be anybody in the government that's doing that. No. Uh, no, no, but, no toughies. Well, you know, we, we, we voted for a change of government. Anything's better than the Ardern Hipkins regime. <laughs> But but you and I are perfectionists, and um, we like to see even people that ostensibly are our team to do better than they're currently doing. And and that's the I get the tone of your article was about that that you were disappointed that they haven't done better. Yes, well, I mean, I don't remember. I don't come from a national party background, no. or I made no secret of having voted for ACT uh, this last time. Mm. Uh, but I just don't think that this government looks to be any better than most of the other national governments uh, uh, that promised the earth and did precious little. And um, uh, I mean, John Key's government was a terrible disappointment. If they were going to uh, uh, get us uh, an economy the equivalent of Australia, and uh, when they get a template put in front of them about how they might go about this, they backed off immediately. And um, it was the same with Sid Holland's government, the same with Keith Holyoaks. The National Party is always the government of the status quo. I've been saying that for, for years and years and years. It's why I'm no longer a member of the National Party, apart from the fact they didn't want me, because I kept pointing at them and saying, you're just the government of the status quo. All you do is manage Labor's reforms. Well, that's that's absolutely right, and uh, uh, that's more or less the thrust of my book uh, on the state in New Zealand. <laughs> It's a terrible state, and we're not going to get ahead until politicians get brave. But MMP do doesn't reward bravery, sadly. 
No, no. In fact, it rewards uh, people that want to uh, slide off and uh, do their own thing. And that makes life more difficult, piecing a coalition together. MMP forces mediocrity and indolence on parliamentarians. Yes, I agree. <laughs> you and I should start a campaign uh, against MMP. I think it's, uh, it, I didn't support it at the time. I thought it was nuts. And it's proved to be nuts. But we can't get rid of it because every time we try and get rid of it, the incumbent prime minister screws the scrum and loads it up with lots of other choices and everyone gets around arguing about the merits of this or that and that and that and all these other things and they don't actually vote to get rid of it and it wins by being mm. the status quo. Yeah. John Key did exactly that. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. He was a disappointment as a prime minister, someone with so much... Uh, ability and it, his government existed uh, so that he could get a knighthood, and um, that's about the size of it. Yeah, well, not not as successful as it could have been, uh, yeah. uh, which is a great uh, pity. All right, my friend. All right. Well, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there, Michael. A pleasure as always having you on the crunch and uh, we'll get you back again whenever something historic or momentous arises and we need your <laughs> sage wisdom. Well, happy to chat and the best of luck with your life in the next in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. I think Michael Bassett is a national treasure. He still thinks the Ardern Hipkins regime was the worst government in living memory, but he also singled out Carmel Cipollone for a special mention, and he didn't hold back. Let me know your thoughts about my chat with Michael Bassett by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, or dislike what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.